Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. So we continue with the Ultimate Raw Vegan Bundle Week. Each day we have at least one person, sometimes they're a chef, sometimes they're a doctor, demonstrating a recipe from their contribution to this amazing Ultimate Raw Vegan Bundle, where you get $3,200 worth of programs and books, all new material for $50, just until November 1st, though. And today's guest has been on the show before. His name is Dr. Doug Graham. You know, a lot of people think of, I don't know if they call you the father of raw food, but everybody definitely looks up to Dr. Graham. And in the raw food world, that's for sure. And then if everybody shorter than him looks up to him. <laughs> I just had to say that. I don't know why. I'm just feeling silly today. But what was interesting is Dr. Graham did a week's worth of shows with me talking about more about the science of raw food. And when his lovely wife was on, she was talking about these kale chips that he makes. And everybody was like, oh, I want to learn how to make them. So today, Dr. Graham is going to be demonstrating his kale chips. Please welcome him back to the show. It's very nice to see you again. Well, thank you very much, AJ. What a treat to be with you. And you know, the first recipe book I ever did was called Simply Delicious. And, and I really have stuck with that idea of keeping things as simple as I possibly can. Um, and it's, it excited me when I saw kale chips come out onto the market commercially. It's like, wow, this is, a, this is quite something. I mean, kale, kale was eaten by the poor people. You know, you could steam it to make it edible, boil it, and, and kind of like what people did to spinach years ago. And, and, and the poor would eat kale because it was so cheap. It grows so prolifically. And, and if you don't have problem with the caterpillars, then you can grow a lot of kale in a small amount of space. And it just keeps coming all winter long. And, you know, kale is so plentiful. And I never thought of it as being more nutritious, but it's certainly as nutritious as the other greens, but it's kind of tough and, and you got to do something to it to make it edible even. You, it's hard to just eat a lot of kale out in the garden. Absolutely. So, but the nice thing is when you dehydrate it and the, the fibers, the coarse fibers um, break, at that point, you know, in the dehydrating process and the whole thing becomes crispy and you can chew it. You can put down a lot of kale in it. And it turned out that my daughter really liked kale chips. So I started making her kale chips and, and we tried everything from just kale in a dehydrator, which is pretty unsatisfactory. To be it's like leaves the kale without anything on it or like leaves in the fall. Yes. I mean, it gets crispy, but... Uh, it's not very, it's not really what she was looking for. And, and I said, okay, well, how simple can I do this? What would make it better? And I said, well, you know, I went to the store to see what, if I am allowed to mention him, Brad, I mean, I know Brad and Brad was selling kale chips and he went national and it got really popular. And, and, um, and I went to go look at what he had and all of his kale chips were salted and there was nothing I could do about it. I haven't eaten salt since I was 18 some 50 years ago so I mean I just wasn't I couldn't buy his kale chips and asked him I called him up on the phone do you make any no no salt and he goes no no there's not enough demand so that was that and a few years went by and and then my friend Curtis up in up in Connecticut who was raw food central for many many years and still is uh, he decided that he was going to give Brad a run for his money and he was going to start making commercial kale chips, but, but a little healthier, you know, no salt and maybe pay a little more attention to what was in it and, and all organic, da, 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 da. So he started making them and I went up to see what he was doing, looked at his giant dehydrators and then eventually his drive in dehydrators. And he, and he started making a bunch of kale and I liked what I saw. It, it seemed better. Um, but I just thought I could do better on my own, as it is with most things. It's better if you make it yourself and, um, uh, might be a nicer to have somebody do all the work in a restaurant, but you can make better food at home. So I decided to just start making my own kale chips. What goes into kale chips? So I wanted to have something that my daughter would eat. 
And I figured pretty much at any, any gathering of raw food people, if we all get together and say, okay, let's make dinner, uh, everybody gives me the job of making the sauce, whether it's the salad dressing or the sauce for a dish or a spread or anything of that sort. I'm pretty good at that. So I feel like I get off easy because I'm doing something that is, easy, is, you know, I'm good at it. And it seems like the quickest job as well. You know, you just throw stuff in a blender. So at the end of the day, I said, okay, what can I put in a blender that's going to make it flavor hit? And the flavors I wanted, um, I wanted to have as many of the different tastes as possible. And that makes kale chips like Lay's potato chips at that point. You can't just eat one. And, and I didn't know at the time that I was creating a monster. And now my daughter eats two and three kilos of kale chips, you know, kilos before they're dehydrated, but she eats two or three kilos of kale chips every week. And she just loves it. I mean, and it's a healthy snack and it, and I'll show you what I put in mine, but um, as a friend of mine who teaches guitar said, well, I said, an acquaintance of mine who teaches guitar says his, his band members accuse him of not being able to play the same song once. Um, I have kind of the same problem with my recipes. Rosie will say, oh, that's really delicious. Make that again. Write that down. I, I don't know what I did. Can't write it down. I can give you the basics, but I, I pretty much never make kale chips the same. And I don't follow like I weigh everything out. I kind of eyeball everything and I use what's available. So a lot of times I would just use lemon juice, but today I had a grapefruit. So I used, I had some lemon too. So I'm using grapefruit and lemon. Um, a friend came over to visit a couple of days ago and left us with one, one Ramiro pepper. Okay, great. So I've got one Ramiro pepper, which I've cut and cleaned out. And, you know, it's the long pointy pepper. So that's what it looks like before it's cut. And, and, I, and I'm going to throw that in because I've got it. And what do you do otherwise with just one pepper? So it'll go in and it'll, it'll add a little something to the flavor. And oddly, you can use any fat you want to use on your kale chips. But some things will make it more crispy and some things will make it a little more chewy. So I tend to stay away from fatty fruits. Don't use those. Uh, and certain seeds, you almost lose them. So for me, typically I'll use almonds. And because I'm making about a pound of kale at a time, sometimes more, but about a pound of kale. Uh, I use a fair bit of almonds. I'll use somewhere between a quarter pound and a half a pound. Depends how generous I want to be. It's like two handfuls for me. And, and I have weighted on occasion. It varies. Anyways, if you're European, it's 100 grams all the way up to 200 grams. I mean, it's somewhere in there. And and it doesn't really matter. They're not necessary. I put them in because my daughter is an athlete and she's not eating anything but raw food in her life by choice. And she's got to get her calories. So in order to, if all she's eaten is a meal of kale chips and the only thing in it is vegetables, she just ate a meal with nothing. Um, this way she can get some calories, get a little bit of almond uh, in the deal. You know, maybe she'll eat a quarter of a quarter pound. So that's an ounce, I guess, um, of almonds. It's not like she's eating something terribly fatty, but at least it gives her some calories too. And, and almonds are good. I'm happy giving her almonds. Uh, I like things that taste salty. I do. And I know that if I don't eat enough vegetables, that I'm going to crave salty things. And I prefer to go through life, as I said, I prefer preferences to cravings. I think craving is kind of the nice word for addicted to. And, and I don't want to be craving, you know, like drug addicts crave, alcoholics crave. And, then, and I didn't want to do that. I wanted to prefer. So I enjoy the taste of celery. I use a lot of celery and I put celery in the kale chips and I'll show you in a second. Um, 
having lived in England and the States, uh, a, a head of celery or what you call a bunch of celery is about 10 stalks in the States, sometimes 11 or 12. But in England, a bunch of celery is usually eight. They don't let it get much bigger than that. They like their celery um, not to get so mature. And that's how you tend to see it in the store. So I actually used a bunch and a half. So I've got about 11 stalks of celery, maybe 12, and chop them up to put into the kale. But you know, some days if there's a lot of kale, I'll, I'll use two bunches and no problem. Um, what else goes in? An, an odd thing, maybe, and I don't know, AJ, if you know why this is, but lemon makes things taste lemony. That part I understand. But why does it also make things taste salty? Okay, so the explanation I got for that was that the taste buds for sour sit right next to the taste buds for salt, and I guess it fools them. That's what I heard. I don't know if it's true, but I'll, I'll go with that explanation until a better one comes. Certainly what they taught us in school was that you had certain taste buds that emphasize certain flavors, you know, that are more receptive to certain flavors, but all your taste buds pick up salt, for instance. So I don't know if that negates or or strengthens your concept. Anyway, I put some lemon in and it gives a background flavor that is nice. Um, if you wish, you could call it zing. I don't put any crack in my crack, in my kale chips, you know, kale crackers, but um, no crack in there, but lemon is about as close as it gets. You could put anything you want into uh, kale chips if you thought of them as potato chips. And, and so you could add a Mexican spice mix. You could add a Moroccan spice mix. You could add Italian herbs. You could add any flavor on top of the basics that you want. And I've tried, I think, all of them because I'm making kale chips at least three times a week, <laughs> all year round. And, and um, and my daughter usually says, I like them really mild. Just celery, tomato, lemon, almond. That's enough. And I'll be thrilled. And you don't, yeah, you could put garlic or onions if you're that kind of person. And it'll, it'll work. But you won't get a lot of garlic or onion flavor because by the time you fully dehydrate, blended onion, unless you chop the onion, but if you fully blend the onion, then all of the volatile uh, oils are going to boil off and you don't get a lot of flavor. If you just chop the onion, then you will get some because there's some trapped inside each piece. So that becomes a choice. Uh, I don't do it a lot just because nobody really asks for it a lot. And a lot of people tell me they have digestive trouble if they eat a lot of onion or even a little onion. So we just, we don't use a lot of it. But this is going to be a dehydrated recipe. Uh, before my daughter was born, I lived 10 years without using a dehydrator. I had tried it back in the 80s and tried everything from watermelon to, you know, to potatoes. But then eventually I just said, you know what? I like fresh food. I mostly want to eat fresh food. I like it right as is. I appreciate it as is. Uh, but when my daughter was little, I started looking for how many things could we make? How can we get more vegetables into people? And a lot of people tell me they like to eat fruit. They don't like to eat vegetables. They can't figure out how to eat enough salad to even control their weight, let alone get enough salad for the mineral density that you would find in salad. But they'll all eat kale chips endlessly. And most of my neighbors ask me if I'll sell them kale chips. And I go, no you wouldn't pay what I would charge. It's, I don't want to do it, but they'll eat. Anybody comes here. You don't have to be a raw food or you don't have to be a vegan or a vegetarian or anybody will eat kale chips and go, oh, these are good. These are really tasty. And the only thing in it, the only thing in it is just vegetables. It's really, I mean, a little bit of like lemon or grapefruit. So, but it is a dehydrated product. <clears throat> and because it's a dehydrated product, I'm going to be putting it on trays 
like this with a Teflex sheet or whatever they call the sheet these days. They've changed the name, I believe. And, um, and I'm gonna put it on there so that the juices don't fall through. And it becomes an interesting little game because if you make the mix too wet, then a lot of the liquid won't stick to the kale and it ends up on the sheets. And you have lovely dehydrated crispy stuff on the sheets, but it's not on the kale. But if you make your sauce too thick, then it's kind of hard to spread it onto the kale. So you got to find that balance somewhere. And in order to help me do that, what I did is I took some tomatoes a few, about five hours ago, and I cut them just in half and put them in my dehydrator and let them dry a little bit because otherwise the whole mixture just comes out too runny and it won't stick to the kale chips. So first item I took, uh, there we go, you can see it. Okay, tomatoes cut in half about that much, but it could be any amount. And sometimes I add a lot more, uh, but if you have, if you have too much sauce on the kale chips, there is a limit to where it stops being nice to eat. It's all sauce and the sauce becomes a bit chewy. Uh, it, it doesn't have the same crack and snap and, and it just, it stops being fun and, and too much sauce, there is a limit. So we're not looking to make, I find about a blender full of sauce per batch of kale is just about right but you could probably do half as much and still get away with it, but twice as much won't work. You end up just dehydrating sauce and it's, it's not a pleasant thing to eat. It really isn't. So I'm gonna take my tomatoes and use my, my little lovely, I love, I love the flexible cutting mats. I think they're just such a treat. And I use this kind of the same way, but don't ever cut on a Teflex sheet. They are the most delicate things you ever imagined. And you won't even see cuts, but the next time you go to use it, it'll come apart in, in ribbons. So I throw in a bunch of, of tomato. It's the basic recipe is tomato, celery, lemon, almond. After that, the world opens up. So I didn't think anybody really needed to see me juicing lemon. So this is the juice of two lemons. Yes, organic, we use organic wherever we can get organic. Uh, in England, England's always been ahead of the States in terms of organic as a country. But I think the whole West Coast of the States is ahead of the rest of the States. Uh, but, but in terms of organic, there's a phenomenal amount of organic food available in England. They're catching up all the time with raw uh, and have come very far with that, but, but they've always been way ahead on the organic thing. Uh, and as I mentioned, I had one grapefruit, a nice pink grapefruit, so I am putting that in the mix. So that's a fair bit of liquid going in, and that's about where we're at. So I want to put in that Romero pepper, which I'm just going to break it in half once. Not that the blender really needs it. The blender's, blender's good. <laughs> it can handle it. And then I'm going to dominate the, dominate the recipe, really, with celery. As mentioned, um, 11, I forgot now whether it was 11 or 12 stalks. I do take the leaves off, by the way. Some people, um, there was a long time where people said the leaves were toxic. I'm not convinced they are, but they are bitter and they do change the flavor. So I'm not really looking for a lot of bitter. Um, so I take the leaves off, although actually the really young leaves, I like those in some recipes. I haven't been able to substantiate that the celery leaves are toxic. Have you ever heard that, AJ, that they're just don't eat celery I leaves? I mean, I've put them in food. I, you know, I, I, I when I've made things, I, I can Google that. I haven't heard that. Okay. I know when I'm, when I'm in Costa Rica, uh, where we're 
you know, doing retreats down in Costa Rica, as I'll be doing this January and February as well, um, that the people who rent me the facility, they want my celery leaves and they use them in soup. So I'll, you know, I'm making food for 18, 20 people at a time sometimes, and they want all the celery leaves. Uh, and then they just, they go, please, you can't give us too much. And if you do give us too much, you know, we'll throw it right back out into the garden, but they, they just put it in soup. So I have almost a blender full at that point. There's not a lot of room to add more, but I still have almonds. And the only way that they're going to fit is once I blend this down just a tiny bit, then there'll be room for the almonds. And it'll be pretty watery. Adding the almonds will thicken it a bit. Um, let me let me take care of that little business right now. Uh, I don't know what kind of blenders you use. My my story with blenders was I used to buy the cheapest blender available, which was a nineteen dollars at Kmart. And one day I was making my lunch, uh, which included one pineapple, dehydrated pineapple ring that I wanted to throw in with a few frozen bananas and a few fresh. And the blade sheared off the motor. So the blade, the motor still spun, but the blade didn't turn because in between there's a gasket that was made out of rubber and that thing broke. So I brought it back to Kmart and they gave me a new one and I went home to make my lunch. Uh, Kmart being less than a mile from my house back then. And, and I went and, and they just gave me a new one, no questions asked, uh, which is rather nice. And, and I put all the mixture back into the new blender and turned it on and the same thing happened. I sheared the, so I went back and they gave me a new one and I tried a third time and sheared a third time and said it was time to invest in a better blender. And it turns out there's a reason why the better blenders cost more money but they're well worth it. And I enjoy having really quality tools. So I'm gonna take this, put it in the blender for just a couple seconds. I agree with you about the blender because you know I've used $20 blenders and they don't last. And so you end up buying like 10 of them, you could have had a high powered blender and they've never been any less expensive. Has anybody Googled whether or not we can eat celery leaves? I was going to do that, but I always worry when I jump screens asking if any of the live viewers have uh, done that. You know, there's a fun question, Dr. Graham, that I'm seeing yes. in the chat. And the, the question is, is if you were being executed, would you eat something other than raw food for your last meal, like maybe a baked potato or something? No, I don't crave it. I don't think it's better. Um, if I was going to have my last meal and I could have what I want, I want Champadec. I, want I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. Champadec is... Um, The simple way to say it is, is it's a cross between a jackfruit and a durian. So it's as easy to eat as a durian, but it's got multiple pods like a jackfruit. Looks kind of like a jackfruit, but when you open it, all the fruit comes completely free. So you can just pull the stem out and have it all be hanging on essentially a racine um, of fruit. And it's, to me, you know, everybody has their favorite fruit. I, I would say my favorite fruit's the one that I'm eating at the time. But if you had me choose in advance, I would choose Champadec. I never heard of it. I'm Googling it and it says that celery leaves are edible and not toxic. And that celery is only toxic if you're eating like several pounds a day, every day. Well, that's interesting. Um, I have found both on the web, is toxic, is not toxic, um, and I haven't found science either way, so I, like I said, I don't know, I don't claim to know. The old hygienic teaching was um, that cell, don't eat the leaves, but that might have been back in the day when people were still eating tomato leaves, learning that those two are toxic, you know, because the the nightshade plants, you don't eat the leaves, you eat the fruit. You know, well, once I had dinner with Dr. Michael Greger, and when he ate the a strawberry, he ate the whole thing, including yeah, me too. them. And when he eats the kiwi, he eats the skin. Me too. 
but my daughter no. But I eat the whole I eat the whole strawberry. I have my salad with my fruit that way, and um, and we were in we were in. Gosh, uh, we were in Christchurch way back. Um, my daughter was just two and a half, and we were in Christchurch, and it was November. What was I thinking going to Christchurch in November? It was, it's like springtime in the States. It's, it's the worst time for fruit. There wasn't a lot of fruit available, but there were kiwi. <laughs> they had a lot of kiwi available. So I, I started eating a lot of kiwi, and people there didn't bother peeling it. They just eat it. So I started eating it, and it's quite good. You do have to still watch out for that little pointy bit, though, because it's really sharp. Do you anyway, eat the cauliflower? Do you eat do you eat the green part of the cauliflower? Um, no, I'm not thrilled with the green part of the cauliflower. I have used it in some recipes for soups and things, but I don't I'm not making that much soups anymore. It's it's um, you know as I got healthier. Over the years, I've become healthier and healthier, it seems like. Uh, one of the things that happened is, is I became increasingly temperature tolerant. So like you were saying one time that you really like the heat. I really like the heat too, but I don't mind the cold. I'm really temperature tolerant. And, and I think that's a good thing to be temperature tolerant. So I'm not looking, I know how to make warm soups. Uh, but I very rarely, I, 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 it's been years really since I've made warm soups, warm it up with my hand uh, in the pot or warm it up on a blender until I see, you know, check it every once in a while to see if it's getting warm without cooking it. Cause you can bring it to a full boil in a blender. Uh, I don't want to do that. But I, I'm, I'm so happy with fruit for breakfast, fruit for lunch, some fruit before my dinner salad that I, I don't vary at all that. I don't feel tremendous. You know, my wife and daughter eat the same breakfast almost every day, bananas and apples, and just kind of chop it up into a pudding, a, a you know, a little like oatmeal -y kind of thing. And, and, uh, and they're happy with that every single day. I have bananas every day of the year for lunch, except the days where there's anything else. So bananas are my go-to. But in persimmon season, I'm eating, I'm eating persimmon. I don't know if you can see that far back, but I've got, I've got six cases in the back there that I just bought the other day. And we'll go through a case a day this time of year. Um, you know, and in lychee season, I'm eating lychee. And mango season, I'm eating mango. But, but anytime that it's not like prime season for something, I'm eating bananas for lunch every day. Anyway, I've made room in my blender. So just by blending down for a couple of seconds, I'm gonna add some almonds. Yes, there we go, almonds. I'll add those in as the last thing. And let's see what happens if I, oh, when you, when you put the top on, so you see the top? Yeah. Okay. So. Um, this particular blender, uh, if you don't put the top on all the way, you're going to have problems. So it locks all the way around. So if you were wondering what I was doing um, with my Blendtec blender is you lock the top on. Otherwise, it's not on all the way and things will get messy. I really like the Blendtec. It was a gift to me. Um, and I'm, wow, one of the nicest gifts I ever got, you know, but it was a gift to me. And I just love the fact that it's so quiet that I, you know, by the time I close the shield, um, you can tell it goes on, but it's, you can talk over it easily. So give me a couple of seconds to blend. Nice. Hey guys, if you haven't checked out the Ultimate Raw Vegan Bundle, click the link. I'll post it in the chat as well as the show notes. And I'll let you know in a minute what Dr. Graham's book or course was in it. I contributed a conference that I did a few years ago in Las Vegas, the live Ultimate Weight Loss Conference. So nobody, unless you were there in person, has seen those exclusive videos. 
There's a lot of great books in there. Let's see if anything, and if you guys ever made kale chips, I've never been able to do it in the oven. Hey, Dr. Graham, I have an Excalibur nitrate dehydrator, but I've never been able to do it successfully in the oven. They get so brittle in the oven compared to the dehydrator, even when I put it as low as possible. The oven is different. Without that moving air, the oven does a different job of dehydrating. Um, when I, I, don't, I sat on a panel discussion one time, I don't even know, 17 years ago, I'm gonna guess. And, and Shauna Verbecki was on the panel and she was the owner of um, Excalibur. She has since sold the company, but she and I had a great time talking to each other, made friends, and she's been a, a strong sponsor of food and sport over the years and gave me a couple of dehydrators to use. And, and, and there, there's good competition for Excalibur, but Excalibur, Excalibur makes a super, good blend, a super good dehydrator. I've never had problems with mine. Um, I have had some wear out, you know, they got 20 years old and wore out, but, but um, eventually the wiring gave out. But uh, they're, they're just super. I've never had a problem with them, but they are different than using an oven um, and having that air move. Uh, anyway, so what I did is I, I started asking her questions one day because almost everything, almost everything that I make in a dehydrator is only ever so slightly dehydrated. Like spinach for five minutes in order to wilt the spinach or a veggie patty for a couple hours in order to give it either a burger or a bowl. But I don't want it to turn into a, you know, into a, the dryness that will make kale chips. I don't want it to be fully dehydrated. And I was asking her because I noticed that the tray four or five dries things faster than tray three and six and one and two and eight and nine dry the slowest. And, and had she, did she, were, was it just my dehydrator or were all the dehydrators like that? And she said, I don't know. We always dry everything completely, like put it in, come back two days later, it's all dry. So uh, I kind of made an art form out of partially dehydrating things to heighten flavors just a little bit. Uh, and, and even tonight when I serve dinner, I'm just going to take some, some lemon tiger tomatoes, which I just cut them in half and put them on the dehydrator for just a few hours. But it dries off a little bit of the water and the flavor remaining is so heightened that everybody in the family uh, just loves eating them just tomato halves. You, don't have, you can put anything you want on them. You can put flavors on them. You can put ground veggies on them. You could put nut mix and whatever on top and make it into a whole thing. But you can just cut a tomato in half and dehydrate it a little bit, serve it up. And everybody goes, wow, this is amazing. So I ended up with a sauce, which looks about like that. And it's, as you can see, relatively thick, but not insanely so. And I'm going to uh, just pour it on. Let's see if I put this. Pour it onto. Now, usually when I buy kale, I buy it in big leaves and strip the leaves one by one so I can do the quality control as I go. Um, but I couldn't get a hold of the leaves until tomorrow. And so I went to the grocery store, my local store, and found organic kale. Lovely. I was very pleased to see that they carried organic now. Uh, but as I say, England's good that way. And I bought a few bags of organic kale. So, but when they run that through the shredder, they run stems and all. So after I pour it in to the big bowl, uh, and I do recommend using an oversized bowl. Uh, once I poured it into the bowl, I then pick through and pull out as much stem as possible because nobody really likes eating a dehydrated stem. <laughs> Flavor or not, it's not a good texture. So you have to consider that. So here goes the, 
There's the tomato what, sauce. What, what can we do with those kale stems? Juice them then? Well, you could juice them and you'd get a little bit out of them, but not a lot. It's mostly, it's mostly just insoluble fiber. I mean, it's getting very close to wood. It's really getting close to wood. Uh, mine ends up in my garden. It goes back in the garden and we start again. Everybody tells me about the spatula that they like best. And, and I like my Vitamix spatula best. I buy extra Vitamix spatula. I use it on everything. Although I've had other spatulas that I really like, I am just fond of this one. It's really predictable. At which point I now have tomato sauce on my kale. I'm gonna give it a toss. I don't mind doing this little bit of tossing. Uh, Dr. Fernando says, if, if they're not completely dry, will they mold? Because you were saying you don't. Yes, if they're not completely dry, they will mold. If they're not completely dry, they become very chewy and not fun to eat whatsoever. Difficult to eat because, because they're, they're chewy like, like eating a rubber band kind of chewy. It's not nice chewy. It's not fun chewy. So uh, what I will do sometimes if, if I created a, like it depends, I use curly kale. There's many kinds of kale. Uh, some of the kale leaves are flatter. And if the kale leaf, if, the, if you use some of the flatter types of kale, then a lot of times the leaves will stack up on each other and the sauce at the bottom won't ever dry. 12 hours, 15 hours later, it still won't be dry. And so I will go after about eight hours and just flip the whole thing over, put it onto a new, onto a new sheet at that point so that the bottom is up and it will continue to dry. Uh, but with curly kale, you don't tend to have that problem unless you just, unless you just stack it on the tray too thick. Uh, I, I definitely don't want to stack it on the tray super thick. And so I've learned that 200 grams of kale, um, which is about a half, a little less than half a pound. Gina said, can we see, can you lower your camera so she can see? Yeah, I'm going to show you what I've got. But all I'm doing is I'm just mixing it and mixing it until it seems pretty thoroughly mixed. And I end up with something that looks like that. How's that? Looks like a salad. Looks like salad. But if you tried to eat it, it would be, okay, my daughter eats some of it raw, in, as is. Uh, she'll definitely come over to me when I'm making kale and start eating kale right out of the bowl. And that's fine. But only a little because it's so chewy. It's just so like, like a whole meal of, of kale salad is, it's possible, but I would not, it, she wouldn't want to do it again and again and again. You need a break from it. So um, at this point, I found that about 200 grams or what would be almost half a pound of kale fits onto a tray pretty well. And I'm just gonna put it on the tray and let's see if I can show you. Uh, I've got enough here so that it'll, it'll make two trays. And that'll all disappear real. That's, that's good for two days, tops. And unless Francesca has a friend come over or something, in which case it's only good for an afternoon. And my clock, I can't tell. Oh, yeah. So yeah, I can, there? I can see the tray. Perfect. You do it on the Teflex. Yep. Okay. So we're just... Just spread it out. You can use your hands. That's perfectly legitimate. Um, I've never been the kind of guy that likes to do that. I'd much rather use a utensil and keep my hands super clean. Don't ask me what that implies about me. I don't know. I don't mind getting dirty as long as I know that I can get clean. But, you know, some people prefer to toss the kale with their hands. I've had plenty of people tell me, oh no, I like to do it with my hands. Massage it and things like that. And I go, nah, that's not me. 
but both ways work. You end up with a tray about like that, a lot of kale. It goes in the dehydrator. It's, uh, it's eight o'clock at night here, almost. So I'm gonna put it in, I'll set it in for overnight. And when I wake up in the morning, it will be completely done. At which point I will put it into something like this. I'll put it into a container about like this. It'll make about that much. And, and there's lots of different kinds of containers available, but I sure recommend, maybe it's not so important, um, maybe it's not so important where you live, AJ, but where we are, uh, humidity is an issue. It's really humid in our part. Of, I live down near the coast and it's, you know, it's just wet here a lot and moss grows on the rooftops and stuff like that. So uh, I use a container that I can seal. It smells great. And yeah, I know they're so good. That end up looking about like that. And, and you can probably hear the crunch. Hmm. I, oh God, I just now I want to make them. I mean, I do, I get lazy because the dehydrator's in the other room. And then, you know, because it, you just can't make enough kale chips. That's for sure. They don't have taste division yet or even smell division. Uh, now I want to make kale chips. You have to believe me. That's really, yeah, they really are the best. Um, so uh, there's a question from Bethany. Uh, uh, do you put the dehydrator at a specific temperature? Good question. Dehydrators work in various ways, depending on the outdoor temperature or the ambient temperature. My dehydrator is outside the house. Again, because if I run it inside the house, my windows upstairs start to go moldy. I tried. I don't have a tiny house, but at the last house I lived in in England, this was a little smaller, um, we grew mold in a matter of days from running a dehydrator inside. So I ended up putting it outside. This time in this house, I tried it again. I go, oh, now I got a big house, you know? Um, if, I run, if I run the dehydrator, all the humidity collects on the windows, inside and we grow mold. It's not nice. So I built a very nice unit about the size of a piano outside and it's right outside my kitchen door. And it's got a door that I open and inside is a box that holds the dehydrator and keeps it dry from out from the weather. But you know, if it's 40 degrees out, the dehydrator has to work a little harder to try to keep 120 on the inside. So it, it does, it is affected by the outside wet or how humid it is or how, um, it was hard to dehydrate stuff when I lived in the Florida Keys, for instance, because it was so humid there that nothing would dry no matter what you did. And if it, even if you did dry it within minutes, it was sucking up moisture from the environment. So I would say this about the temperature, you can use a higher temperature if you want to play with your dehydrator or speed things. You can, in the first hour to two of dehydrating a product, you can use a higher temperature, 140, 145 maybe even, because the product is sweating. In fact, I believe that's the technical term for it in, in culinary terms. You're sweating the food. And as the food sweats, the food stays cool while it's losing its water, just like you do. But when you get fully dehydrated or close to it, you know, to where you can't lose any more water without it becoming dangerous for you, now your temperature just goes right up. It rockets up. And the same thing would happen to the food. So I'm not going to be playing with it tonight. I'm not in a rush. I'll just put it on at 120 to 125, somewhere around there. Um, and I just let it go all night. It'll be dry in the morning. Now I will, the other end of that is if you try to go too low, especially with tomato products, tomato products will mold before they dry. 
which gives you a little bit of motivation to boost it for the first hour or two. Or in my case, I didn't try to overload the tray. That way it'll all dry. It'll dry just fine. I'm not going to get anything going moldy and I don't have to, I don't have to push it. Um, there's various people say various things about what is raw or what's the right temperature. Uh, the 118 thing, I don't buy that. I don't really believe that. I've been in Texas running at 126 degrees outside and the trees were growing just fine. So I know it goes up to 130, 131 in Death Valley and there's plenty of plants growing out there. Uh, so I'm not really thinking that that's it. Apparently around 135, you start to do enzyme deactivation. According to uh, USDA, you can get some enzyme deactivation at about 135. And I don't really want that to happen. So I keep it like 125. That helps. But Dr. Graham, Maureen said, is there something besides uh, almonds that you can use? Yeah, as I said, as I mentioned, you could use you could use any nut and each will impart its own distinct flavor. I've done walnuts. Um, I, I like doing it with sunflower seeds. I've used pumpkin seeds. They all work. It's just what do you have a lot of at the moment uh, or what do you have best access to? Uh, some people say almonds are the best nut because they're the only nut whose pH uh, ends up just on the alkaline side of neutral, whereas all the other nuts are just on the acid side of neutral. But the difference, there's really not much in it, not enough to make a big deal. Uh, we like almonds, so I use almonds, but any nut, any nut would do, any seed would do. Mm -hmm. And there's a probably not flax seed though, would they? Would flax or chia work? That I would think maybe not as good as pumpkin or sunflower. No, flax and flax and chia will work, but they're not going to be very um, rewarding to eat. They just don't come out anywhere near as rewarding. Is the only way I can say it. There's, there's you get the the greeniness, you know the 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 hard fiber of the whole thing, you notice it. Whereas the creaminess that comes in from, from using sunflower seeds or almonds or, I mean, if I was in Hawaii, I'd probably use macadamia nut. Mm -hmm. People are asking about a convection oven and a fan bake oven, which I'm, I know what a convection oven is, but I've never heard of a fan you bake can, oven. You can dehydrate in those ovens and, and especially one that has a fan, you can dehydrate. Uh, you kind of have to watch it and you have to be a little bit aware of the temperature. I don't think it's a very efficient way to do it because, you know, you, you're, you've got a tray. Maybe you have two trays in the whole oven. Uh, whereas... No, you get nine oven, trays in the Excalibur. Nine trays in the Excalibur. Although with, with kale chip, I will tend to only max out at four uh, because I give them the double space. Right. They just sit up a little higher. But for most other things, you can go nine trays and just boom, 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 unless you're making, you know, stuffed mushroom caps or something, which I'll do for a Christmas meal. But uh, that makes sense. Hey, you want to talk about what you're offering to the Ultimate Raw Vegan Bundle was? Oh, it's I'm offering something completely off the wall, AJ. I don't know if you've seen. I opened <laughs> it. something jungle about the jungle. <laughs> it's the jungle. Uh, years and years ago, I just got so fascinated by the jungle. I mean, it's, it's as unexplored as deep sea diving on the reef, you know, it's the jungle is just wild. And down in Costa Rica where they have the densest life, um, the densest life numbers, much more, much more per square inch of, of jungle. There's more forms of life than even in the Amazon in the Costa Rican jungle. I just, I just had a blast walking through the jungle and, and I liked how my awareness changed of what do I have to pay attention to? You know, there's not like danger signs or things. You just have to be aware of what's going on around you. So um, I did a lot, a lot of hiking in the jungle over the last 30 years and eventually wrote a book about it called A Walk in the Jungle, which I was hoping would convey some of my hygiene philosophy, the science of human health philosophy, as it applied to us living 
a, a more natural lifestyle, walking in the jungle, visiting the, being immersed in nature. So I wrote a walk in the jungle and never published it. But when I finally started making audio books, I had professional speakers, professional readers do it because I listened to a lot of audio books and I, I know the difference between hearing a pro and, and not, you know, somebody that's amateur. And, but the comment I got again and again is, oh, we wish you did it in your voice. Oh, we'd like to hear it in your voice. So I did it as an experiment. I got, I got locked down in Costa Rica two spring times ago when people got stuck everywhere. I got stuck in Costa Rica and I had a couple, couple months on my own. So I recorded audio books of things I'd written that had never been published. And one of them was A Walk in the Jungle. So it's, it's gone through a year of editing and we just finished it a couple of days ago, finally with photography and all the editing, putting it all back together. And we, we uh, if you've heard of science fiction, this is, this is science hygiene. So it's high sci and um, it's, to me, it's just a lot of fun. It's, it, it's, it's not a romance or anything. It's just respect for the wildness of nature and what's out there and how much you see in the course of a day. Uh, it's, it's being met. I, I, I've read it now through to about a hundred people and everybody goes, I want a copy. So I'm really hoping that it's going to be a big hit. And the first place we're making it available is on this bundle. It's available nowhere else except through the bundle. So uh, I, I think the bundle's a no brainer. I was glad to be involved in it. And that was my contribution. That is fantastic. Thank you. Look forward yeah. to reading it. And John is saying, could you please give an overview of your retreat in Costa Rica this coming January? I'm doing a two-part retreat. Um, part one is for people who are looking to make quantum leaps in their health. And it's going to be primarily start with a water-based fast and finish with a feast and rebuilding the body. Take a couple of weeks to do each part of that. And um, it's something that I've done in Costa Rica now since 96. And before that, for 20 years, I did it in Florida. So uh, it's something that I really enjoy. And I find the benefits are just so phenomenal that I, I like seeing that in people, uh, whether they are uh, have conditions that they haven't been able to overcome any other way, and it's time to fast, or whether they're athletes and they want to bring their performance to new levels, or they just are in great health, but they want to, they want to make that quantum leap to ultimate really abundant health. Um, I count my blessings of, you know, not being sick in the last 40 years and um, live in a lifestyle that allows me to stay healthy. So that's the one part of it. But the second part of it is a lot of people want to come and they don't want to fast, but they want to live the lifestyle. They want to learn about what goes on in a high level of health. How do we think in a high level of health? Um, what do we have to know about the body? What are the sciences we have to know? Uh, how do you take care of somebody else who's, who wants to improve their own health? How do you be a force for good in other people's lives? So um, I call this an intern program and people come and they intern with me. They train with me if they wish to, they don't have to, but they'll train with me every morning. Uh, we'll have breakfast, lunch, and dinner together. I'll run a class on health at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then they can also attend all the lectures that I do for the fasters, which is the whole afternoon in between lunch and dinner, um, usually for about three hours every day with the fasters giving them health information. And so they get to participate in all that. It's kind of like going to school, but you're living at the school and um, immersing. So a lot, of, a lot happens in a month. I've got a fair number of videos describing both programs on my webpage, on the food and sport webpage. Um, if they go to the fast and click on it, and then they can look at the videos uh, that from former interns and from former fasters and from myself. Right. So that's where they can find dates and prices. Cause I did. Oh yeah. January website. 1 through oh. February 12th. Wow. Right. Well, February 12th. I know that date. That's when my summit starts. That's wonderful. Yeah. So as Susan says, are you going to do retreats in Florida again? 
if I found a location, if I found something to do there, I mean, I, I have a center in, in just north of Seattle, Washington that I've been using for almost 20 years now. And I'm really looking forward to going back, although Washington has been a little funny the last few years. Um, so I hear, but I'd like to go back to that place. I've got all my equipment there. All my kitchen is there. All my sports equipment is there. Um, I, the facility works perfectly for me. So probably if I go back, um, which I'm hoping to do in September of whatever's coming now, 2022. I'm hoping to be back in September of 2022, back in Cedar Willie, Washington. Um, but I'll certainly do appearances in Florida. I'm looking forward to the next appearance in Florida. I'll go anywhere I'm invited. Nice. Well, uh, Johanna says, I'm glad to hear you recording an audio book. Uh, she said, you have a very good audio book voice. Oh, bless your heart. That's very kind. I, I really honestly felt quite insincere about that, uh, insecure about that. Uh, but when I was in in that lockdown, I recorded three books, and now the second one is being edited. Uh, and by the time we finish that one, I'll, you know, the third one will come, which will be 101 fasting case histories. Uh, so I'm looking forward to all those coming out, and hopefully by then I'll have motivation to do a few more. Oh, great. I look forward to hearing it because I like, that's how I prefer to absorb books. Is I listen to audio books all day long. Yeah, me all too. It's so great. It's so great. Well, it's just so fun catching up with you and thank you for the recipe. It looks a treat delicious. to be with you. Thank you for giving me this platform and opening up to, to people. Oh. Um, you know, Kale, yeah, as they say. And <laughs> I, always, I always encourage people to up your health and, and you too, AJ, up yours. Um, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's funny that's you are hilarious okay well thanks Have so a much. lot of fun thank you for promoting this this raw bundle yeah. and right being exactly part of it. you know i'm not you know i'm not raw i was for a couple of years but you i want a lot of raw food and you eat, eat a lot of raw food I want I'm, vegan. I'm a vegan too you know, and I you know what we're we're both sos it. free the thing is is it, except for the fact that i eat starch we're almost the same because no yes. i'm sos very, free, I mean, SOS free. It, we're very similar so Actually, yeah. I did I did an interview with a lady the other day who's new on the health beat, but she now has a job where she's on the health beat for a reporter for a magazine. And she was interviewing me and she said, what's the difference between a vegan and a raw vegan? And I said, starch. That's the difference. Yep. It's because not all, not all the not all the raw vegans, uh, some of them eat SOS and a lot of, of it. Of <laughs> so there's so even I like to eat really clean. I like my whole fresh riper organic plants um and and i don't look down on anybody and, and for me i feel like i'm a vegan you're a vegan end of story we meet on common ground and and you know that's that's all there has to be to it I, there's no judgment involved i, I want to be included and i don't want to exclude anybody right that's what i love about all the guests i've been having on but the end of the day eat more kale Eat more kale. Absolutely. I actually have, you know, I actually have a shirt that says that. Kale, I should have yeah. worn, worn that today. Oh, my bad. All right. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Graham. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Come back in two hours. We have another wonderful culinary demo. Where we're going to be making chili. Say hi to your wonderful wife. Take care. I have to show you my, my raw chili next time I'm on the show. Absolutely. I look forward to it. <laughs>